All of this evidence has to start adding together, and it, the sum has to work. And let me give you a model that you can take to anybody's geography. These are interesting textual things. They haven't been pointed out to me like this before. And thus the face of the whole earth became deformed because of the tempests and the thunderings and the lightnings and the quaking of the earth. Wow, a lot of destruction. There's, there's a lot of destruction. There's a lot of description of the destruction and that allows somebody who knows what geological events are like to be able to say this is what's happening there. If, if Joseph Smith had made a thus saith the Lord pronouncement, you would expect that somebody would have known. And all of the apostles and close associates seem to have had a wide range of things they believed. And then he presented this, and I want to get your thoughts on it. In 1833, Joe Smith penned a letter to the editor of the American Revivalist and Rochester Observer in which he described the Book of Mormon in the following. He says, the Book of Mormon is a record of the forefathers of our western tribes of Indians. Welcome to the Stick of Joseph YouTube channel. Today, our interviewee, at least for me, it was super anticipated because I've seen a ton of interviews with this guy. His name is Brant Gardner. And Brant Gardner is one of the top researchers in the Mesoamerican geography theory for the Book of Mormon. And the first thing that he wrote that kind of put him on the scene was a 3,000 word commentary. Not 3,000 words, that's not that long. It was a 3,000 page commentary mm, on the at book first of i was like i'm gonna give that a read and then now i'm like i'll wait for the movie to come out <laughs> yeah so so <laughs> but he uh it was a really enlightening conversation he brought up a lot of things regarding the mesoamerican theory that i hadn't yet considered actually and super enlightening, i really enjoyed yeah. it so even if you are a heartlander you will find this to be interesting and he brings up some really good points mm -hmm. so we just want to say thank you to all of the patreon supporters that are supporting the stick of joseph production we can't do this without you guys and we just barely did a giveaway and we gave away some cool stuff. We're going to be doing some more in the future. So if you want to be a part of those giveaways and you want to support the channel, then you can do that by clicking on the link in the description. We love you guys and enjoy the interview. Welcome everybody to the Stick of Joseph YouTube channel. Today we have a very special guest. He is an esteemed scholar who has written, and I just learned about this, 3,000 pages is just one of the works that you've That's done. The, yeah, that was the first thing I published. That was the, the first yeah. thing you published was 3,000 words having to do with Book of Mormon evidences in mm. Mesoamerica. It was, it's a commentary in the Book of Mormon, but it takes a... It says that if we're putting the, the Book of Mormon in the real world, does it inform the text? Does it? Okay. And so it's, it adds that in, but it's a commentary that also looks at uh, linguistics. It looks at culture. It looks at uh, uh, poetry. It, it tries to be as comprehensive a commentary as we can put together. Well, that is legendary. Awesome. And so we're super excited to have him in the studio. First off, for our viewers, for those who aren't familiar, just give us spark notes a little bit about <laughs> what, how, how this all started, this, this obsession and this, this hard work that you've done. Yeah, and, and I think it's important to start there because my beginning point was as a true believer in the Thomas Stewart Ferguson book, one fold, one shepherd. I thought this was absolutely wonderful. And, and what's the basic premise of that book for those who don't well, know? Well, the basic premise of, there, there's two things you have to know about the book. I mean, one of them is it says that Mesoamerica is the location for the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. And the second is it has a methodology for doing that that is, it, it's list-based. And so it says, here are 300 items that you see in Mesoamerica, and here are the same 300 items in the old world and because there's 300 items in both places, that means that they happen. You know, there's a, mm -hmm. connection, there's a connection between them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that's a terrible methodology. It's just absolutely, you know, anytime I see that or anything like it, you, you just sort of shake your head because it's, it doesn't show you anything. Because human beings are similar all around the world. Yeah, so there's just as much. Well, for example, one of them was uh, mud, br you know, mud bricks, adobe bricks. Yeah. Huh? Okay, now <laughs> dried mud is something that probably more than one person has thought about. For sure. And, and so, you know, the fact that they have that in two different places does not really surprise you. Okay. Now, there are saying. some things on lists like that that, you know, that where are you go, oh, wow. Uh, one of them, for instance, is, is fish. It talks about fish and uh, fish and uh, newborns, and you know, or uh, spirit children or young children or something are connected mm -hmm. with fish. And you see that in Egypt, and you see that in Mesoamerica. Yeah. And so you, I have. You're seen talking that. like in carvings and hieroglyphs. Yeah, and stuff. yeah. Okay. So the symbology of the of the fish would yeah. say 
you know, this is why you see it. There's there's some spirit descending, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. And you go, wow, that's that's pretty cool because you know that seems pretty weird, Very but specific. there it is, and yeah. And then you realize that there is a time in the fetus when it has gills. Mm-hmm. And anybody who has gone through and unfortunately seen the fetus that has gills is going, yeah, gills, fish, but. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, this is a human thing. Mm-hmm. And you can't say there's a connection because that's simply biology. Mm-hmm. But I found all of this later and found multiple things where I started looking at everything that anybody had told me, not only Mesoamerica, but uh, there, there are, the church had put out videos called Ancient American Speaks. And I remember talking with some of my um, archaeologist friends at BYU and he said, you know, we'll put this thing on when we want a good laugh. Mm. It's just terrible work. Mm-hmm. Like, again, it's just, you know, methodology is bad and, you know, pretty pictures. Yeah. Um, but the methodology was terrible. And so I got to the point where I said, you know, I, we just aren't going to know where the Book of Mormon took place. We, we have no idea. Mm-hmm. And then I went and mentioned that to John Sorensen. He's like, watch me. <laughs> well, what he said was, what if I could tell you that there are archaeological sites that carbon-14 date to the correct time period and are in the correct interrelationship with each other uh, and match up with, you know, some of these other things? He says, would that help you? I said, Give me that. Yeah. <laughs> that. That I want to know. And so this was... Uh, well, maybe 10 years before he finally published. Yeah. Um, so I got a chance to read the manuscript. He was very generous with handing out this manuscript. I wish I'd have kept the manuscript. After I got the book, I got rid of the manuscript. I'm like an idiot. Mm. wish I had it. Anyway, uh, but I read that and I said, okay, now. Now I've got something I can hang on to because it's a, a, um, a tight enough methodology that I can look at it and say, okay, yeah, that's going to work because I've got to find things in the right place at the right time. You know, if I find somebody that, uh, you know, lives in this area, but it's a thousand years too early or a thousand years too late, it doesn't, doesn't, work. doesn't help me. So that's where things started. Uh, and, and it started with Sorensen. And then, of course, the more I read Sorensen, the more I said, you know, we mostly agree, um, but I think there's some things that, be expounded that on. That I would like mm-hmm. I would like to use a different methodology. There was too much of his methodology that leaned heavily into lists. Mm-hmm. Uh, he knew Thomas Stewart Ferguson. They were both in the New World Archaeological Foundation together. Uh, and so this concept of lists is something that uh, that I think had informed the way Sorensen worked. Uh, I think also he was of the generation that in, in his first book, not so much in his second, Mormon's Codex, it came out a little bit more. But the idea that uh, the, basically the Nephites caused Mesoamerican civilization. To, a- mm. to actually flourish. We, well, yes. yeah, sort of brought things in. They were the, the you know, the They weren't the building impetus. the stone before, and they weren't doing Yeah, the, yeah. yeah whatever mm-hmm. it was. And as an archaeologist, well, I'm an anthropologist. But as an anthropologist, I know that's not true. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we know much more about the history. Uh, and, you know, the Maya civilization, for example, was getting well underway by 2000 B.C. Well, that's kind of before the Nephites. And so you know, this whole idea that the Nephites caused civilization and taught them how to write, and mm-hmm. we know that's not correct. However, there are some things that are kind of important, which is, the Nephites wrote, and the only place we know of in the entire Western Hemisphere, the only place where we have record of writing is uh, in Mesoamerica. So, you know, something there is at least yeah, curious. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, you know, back to your question, how did I get into it? Uh, that's kind of the beginning. Cool. Now, I will warn you, I am prone to long answers. All mm-hmm. right. We'll, so we'll yeah. have a few questions then. <laughs> yeah, you have, you have to understand, <laughs> depending on the question you ask, I am prone to long answers. I'm the mm-hmm. same way. Don't worry about it. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, I let's get into it because we've had uh, people on that have talked about the Mesoamerican model before. Yeah. But well, we had Kirk Magleby on, for example, mm-hmm. yes. and we talked to him for two and a half hours. And we only talked about the methodology, but we never actually got into the geographic yeah. model. We never actually mm-hmm. got into the evidences. And so I guess the first, it, let's start off with this one. A lot of people that are watching, um, 
I, we know a lot of our audience believes the Book of Mormon happened in the United States of America, in North yeah. America, in the heartland. Right. What, to you, what is some of the most, let's just talk about a few of the most compelling evidences of why you believe it, it happened in Central well, America. Let, let's back up just a half step before let's that. Do it. And mm-hmm. let me give you a model that you can take to anybody's geography and say, here's a way to make a judgment. If I have three people who give me three different things, mm-hmm. we have the Heartlands, the Mesoamericans, and the Baja. Mm-hmm. Throw in South America. You yeah. know, mm-hmm. Any of the ones, you know, we've got lots of people saying lots of different things. How do you judge? How do you know? Well, one of the things you could do is just say, well, I mentally prefer this one <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's just the one i grew up with yeah. and i don't want to change my mind yeah that's fits a, with that's my worldview mm-hmm. yeah uh, but is that the right way to judge mm-hmm. so the right way to judge it is is not simple because if it were simple we'd have done it mm-hmm. and we'd all be on the same page yeah we'd all be on the same page but i can give you some things that will help and it's a layered approach mm-hmm. and so the very top layer is geography Now, I'm not going to talk much about geography because the fact of the matter is there isn't any geography out there that doesn't pretend to fit. Mm -hmm. Now, you can argue it, Mm -hmm. but everybody has a narrow neck of land somewhere Somewhere. because you know you got one and Uh you have to have one. Mm -hmm. Now, whether it's in the right place or not, that's that's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, But I'm not going to talk about that one because, you know, at the moment, just let everybody say they've got it. You know, let's find something else. However, there are two things that I think are really important um, that get ignored in geography. So everybody makes their geography, and they know they've got to find a narrow neck of land. They know they've got to find some oceans somewhere. They know they've got to find, you know, whatever it is you're going to find. Mm-hmm. What they forget is there's some cities that you have to place, and they'll do really well with Camorra and Zarahemla because those are big places. Those are big ones. They forget Bountiful and they forget Manti. Mm-hmm. And we've got a lot of really good information in the Book of Mormon about those two places, but they forget them. Mm-hmm. And so if you really want to, a quick check on a geography, don't look at Camorra. Don't look at Zarahemla. Somebody's going to find that and make an argument for mm-hmm. it. You need to look at Bountiful. You need to look at Manti. We got them here in Utah. Actually, right? (laughs) We figured out. Solved. I wonder what percentage of the population knows that that came from the Book of Mormon. From the Book of Mormon, I know. That's true. Yeah, really. So what are the important characteristics about those cities? The the first thing is that both of them are are important defensive locations. Mm. Bountiful is a... Bountiful is built near the east sea and near the narrow neck of land and it is a fortress city that controls the movement of land going northward Mm -hmm. and so for everybody who's supposed to go northward bountiful is the fortress that protects that so that you know only the right people get to go through okay now if you have a narrow neck of land that is let's say 700 miles wide Mm mm-hmm you go around Bountiful, Mm -hmm. okay? You've got to have a narrow neck of land or else Bountiful can't control it. So even when I get to Mesoamerican folks and they say Bountiful is on, you know, like the east coast of Of the 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 Paten, Mm -hmm. but the land northward is way over here, I've got a problem because it it isn't doing what it's supposed to do. Bountiful has to be uh, a a military thing. Well, Mm -hmm. Manti is the same thing. Manti is also controlling the major route that the Lamanites always take from the land of Nephi into the land of Zarahemla. Uh Are there any references in the scriptures that you can think off of top of head that we could that we could pull out? If no, not, because I'm okay. not I'm not good at that. Yeah, yeah. One, you know, one of the things it, it's kind of like everybody with cell phones and phone numbers. Nobody you knows phone numbers uh-huh. anymore. Okay, uh-huh. I don't know verses. I can look them up when I need to. My computer knows all of those. Yeah, I don't have to remember uh-huh. those. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, and no. so I don't. Okay, it's all good. I was yeah. just seeing if we if you did. Yeah, no. Uh-huh. Sorry about that. <laughs> I can, I can tell you why it's important. I have to find the yeah, darn find thing. But, but what happens is, you know, it's on this route. It's near the headwaters of the center. It's near the head of the Sidon, which everybody mm-hmm. defines differently. Um, but it's near a thin strip. You have, everybody gets to figure different things out. But the point is it's a military bottleneck. It's, again, controlling an access point. And if you have this thing sitting out in a plane... It isn't controlling anything because you can just go around it. Yeah. Okay. If you have it next to a big river, 
and there's no bridges, it's not controlling anything because you just, you know, bypass it, you know, take the river down and come across some other way. Yeah. You know, you have to have something that says Manti, uh, you know, is controlling it. And it needs a valley to the east of it because there's another story that talks about people coming in the valley to the east. And so we've got a lot of good information. But because we don't talk about it much, uh, the geographers tend to forget that one. And they will frequently... Uh, you know, just Leave toss, that, it, toss in it in somewhere. somewhere where it fits. But if you know what it's supposed to do, it doesn't do that. So yeah. there's your geography level, and I'm okay. not going to argue yes. more on that because, yeah. frankly, it's uninteresting. To and, me. and it's just it's hard to. I mean, who who knows what two thousand years of the Earth does to a land is is the first thing. And Actually, geographers have, they know, a, good they have idea. a pretty good pretty good oddly idea. enough. Pretty good idea. Yeah. <laughs> oddly enough, I mean, in geologically, two thousand years is nothing. Is nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. what we do know, for example, even down in Mesoamerica, we know that uh, the two major rivers, the Grijalva and the Usumacinta, particularly the Grijalva, has changed its path, its course in the last thousand years. Mm-hmm. You know, the where how it hits the uh, the ocean is different. It goes, it enters the ocean in a different place. But we have, you know, enough records. We have, we can see the sediment. We can see mm-hmm. where everything, and we can we can trace okay. that out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but that leads to the next one because you, you start with geography and then the next one down is geology. Mm-hmm. Okay. Geology is critical because there are certain things that we have to know. And one of them is you really can't have any model that makes up a geography that can't exist. So, for example, one of the reasons that I have a hard time dealing with, let's say, a South American geography the culture works really well. There's a lot of things that are really, really interesting about South America. But in order to get Nephite land, you have to have the entire Amazon basin underwater mm. at a time when people were living there. Mm. Mm-hmm. <sighs> this doesn't work. Uh-huh. doesn't work. The, you know, and we know this because we know how geography, where geology works. We know what the water levels were like. Um, it is absolutely true that at one point in time, uh, there was a, a full land bridge that would fill the Gulf of Mexico, so you could walk from Mexico to Florida. Mm. But really? So many, oh, yeah. How long ago? Um, Twenty thousand years ago? Oh, okay, something yeah. <laughs> a little <laughs> long time ago. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, long enough ago that. I have seen that proposed as a Book of Mormon geography, but maybe twenty thousand years ago. Yeah, how do we know? Yeah. How, what is the what is the process by which they find that number? Because I, I'd assume they're just they're, yeah. How how do they do that? Do you know? Uh, th- there's a lot of things in geology that that deal with stratigraphy. So. Uh, everything is layered, and okay. then what happens is faults will change, and these layers might tilt, mm-hmm. the layers might drop. But, and, and if they get inverted in something really, really weird happening, the layers are still in the same order. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you never get this thing going like that. Mm-hmm. You always have these nice layers. And when you can identify the layers, you can coordinate them with other things, and then sometimes, depending on how lucky you are, uh, find something that you can carbon-14 date mm. okay, into so, those things. So in that sense, like with the land bridge, they would grab sediment from yeah. underneath the ocean and and then match it with sediment that's on yeah. land right, and then right. carbon-14 yeah. date it? it? Which is the way, for example, that we know that uh, that far back mm-hmm. in the Earth's history, before the tectonic plates started moving away, we had what they call Pangaea, which mm-hmm. is everything was sort of fit together. Yeah. And you can kind of see that if you look at like Europe and Africa and you kind of squish them together and you go, oh, that looks like they might actually fit together with mm-hmm. the eastern seaboard of the western hemisphere. Yeah. Then you look at uh, the sediment layers and the way things are built in the Appalachian Mountains and the way they are uh, on the eastern. And you go, yeah, these are the same. Mm-hmm. You know, this is the, these two it's really fit. are the same. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so you actually have evidence that, that these things were together. Now, this is a long, sure. long time yeah. ago. You yeah. know, this is not human history mm-hmm. at all. But they can show those things. So geologists understand certain kinds uh, of things. With uh, Sorry, I, I, I'm just really curious. I want to understand yeah. this. With... Um, c- with dating and things of that nature, can that be skewed by 
um, unusual geolo- geological events or catastrophic events. So, for example, because that's that's the part I always have a hard time with is it's like the certainty of dates when there's so much uncertainty with how the world works. There is predictability well, to some degree. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a, any geographer will tell you or a geologist will tell you that if, you know, if we say it's, you know, a million years ago, it's a million years plus or minus 100,000, you know. Mm-hmm. It's sort of like, yeah, are we, you know, dead on <laughs> accurate? Heavens no. Yeah. You know, we don't know these things. Yeah. Uh, it's sort of like, and, and this is a point I'm getting to, volcanic eruptions. We'll talk about that in a second. But those are very hard to date because there's only certain things that we can do to date them. And none of them will get down to the right year. They're always going to give you a range of about you know 50 to 100 years on either side of this. Mm-hmm. So geologists are, are not going to say there's an, you know, an adamant thing. Now, if you start from the present and start working back and you're not doing geological time, we get better. Carbon-14 dating can be corrected and in some places has been corrected with dendrochronology, which is tree rings. Okay. And they have series of tree rings where they can match the tree rings up. And even though you don't have, you know, single tree, you can match the rings on this one. And, oh, yeah, this part of this tree matches this, man, this matches. And so you can count the tree rings and then you carbon 14 carbon 14 date the things and you go you know these things are not that far off so for human history uh you know going back to let's say ten thousand years or so uh, we're we're actually reasonable Mm -hmm. you know i mean within a couple hundred years okay um so yeah if if geologically if you can get plus or minus 100 years for most of it you're doing pretty well Mm -hmm. Uh, the closer you get to our own time period, you know, you get it down to plus or minus 25 years or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you can't do dead on accuracy. Okay, cool. But enough that you can say, you know, is this, let's say, is this during Book of Mormon times? Yes mm-hmm. or no. Okay. Mm-hmm. And on some of you say, boy, we're right on the cusp. Mm-hmm. Maybe. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. The rest of it you can go, yeah, not even close. Mm-hmm. So Thank you for indulging my curiosity. I oh, appreciate yeah, it. Not okay, a problem. But continue. Uh, yeah, uh, so. yeah, and anybody who's a, a geologist and is listening is pulling their Chime hair in. out saying, yeah. you know, <laughs> this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, which is true. I'm not a geologist. Um, but back to, you know, how do the you, how do you mm-hmm. uh, measure these things? Well, you start off with the uh, geographic and then everybody gets that, and so you argue about that. But you've got to go a little deeper. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's say you find something. You say, okay, this is this is pretty cool. I, I think that's good. Now I've got to go down to the geological layer, and I can't have something that contradicts it. I can't have land underwater. I can't have you know Atlantis, and you know there's all kinds of things I can't have because you know it's happening at the wrong time. But we have a major geographic event in the Book of Mormon, which mm-hmm. is all of the destruction that's happening before Christ uh, before Christ comes. And those are described pretty well. Yeah. yeah I mean, there's a thick description. 16 mm-hmm. different cities went. Yeah. I mean, there, there's and, and how they do it and the thunder and the lightning and the sounds and, you know, lightning like you've never seen before. Um, so these are all things that a geologist can look at and say, well, what would cause that? What mm-hmm. could possibly cause that? And I do not know of any geologist who has looked at those things who has not said, that's a volcanic eruption. Mm-hmm. Now, I have seen people who do not have any training in any science mm-hmm. say that it might have been something else. For example, let's say it was an earthquake because the earth is rumbling, etc. And this one guy who is a, uh, a geologist says, yeah, probably not an earthquake because it talks about these rumblings going on for hours. And he says, earthquakes last like two minutes. Mm. True. You know, mm. so there's, I mean, it's a big shock. Yeah. But the Book of Mormon says this goes on for hours. Well, what goes on for hours? Volcanic eruption. And, and the erupting force is creating these vibrations in, in the land. And so the volcano does that. And, you know, with everything else, all of these things put together, again, people who know the science look at this and they say, boom. Now, if you, uh, if you, have you talked to Jerry Grover? We no. have not. That was someone we he's, were recommended. He's, he's on the list. I, I recommend you talk to him about okay. uh, geology. Is he a his, geologist? 
He is a geologist, okay. uh, and his book, uh, Geology of the Book of Mormon, is available online for free in a PDF format. Cool. Um, I recommend everybody skim through the first part of it unless you like re- geology because yeah. it's, <laughs> it's, it's very, very dry. Deep. Yeah. Uh, but when you get into how it fits into uh, Third Nephi, uh, it's it's remarkable stuff. Uh, he not only says this is a volcanic eruption, he will locate the most likely volcano to have erupted that is close that enough time. to Book of Mormon lands that it would have created those effects, uh, and it had an explosive event during the during time, time period. Huh. Now, this is when it goes we'll back to where I said out. you've got a range. Uh, yeah. Mm. Okay? There's no way we can say, yeah, this happens to be the one because we know it happened right at the right time. Okay. You've got a range. Mm. Do, do you mind if we read the few verses oh, that you're referring to no, real quick? No, no, no. Go ahead. So in Third Nephi chapter 8, this is kind of, I, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is what you're referring to. It says, in verse 17, it says, And thus the face of the whole earth became deformed because of the tempests and the thunderings and the lightnings and the quaking of the earth. And behold, the rocks were rent in twain, and yea, they were broken up upon the face of the whole earth, insomuch that they were found in broken fragments in, and in seams and in cracks upon all the face of the land. And it came to pass that when the thunderings and the lightnings and the storm and the tempest and the quakings of the earth did cease, for behold, they did last for about the space of three hours. Mm. And it was said by some that the time was greater. Nevertheless, all these thing, uh, all these great and terrible things were done in about the space of three hours. And then, behold, there was a darkness upon the face of the land. And it came to pass that there was a thick darkness upon the face of all the land, insomuch that the inhabitants thereof, which had fallen could feel the vapor of darkness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One mm-hmm. thing that's interesting to point out is like if Joseph Smith was just making this all up, what a weird what a weird thing to put in there, right? <laughs> it was for the space of three hours. Some people thought it was longer, but it suffices to say that it was yeah, like yeah, about yeah. three hours. Because I'm carving <laughs> the plates here. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, okay, yeah. Wow. A lot of destruction. There's there's a lot of destruction. There's a lot of description of the destruction mm-hmm. and that allows somebody who knows uh, you know what geological events are like to be able to say this is what's happening there. And another one is, and there were exceeding sharp lightning, yeah, such yeah. as never been known in all the land. Yeah, and think about that. Yeah, you explain, know, please. It's well, like how do volcanoes? <laughs> but most people are like, oh, lightning and volcanoes. Well, yeah, I mean, lightning is is a static electric charge, mm-hmm. and so when all of that is getting thrown up, it's altering the the static electricity, and so there's a lot of uh, lightning that gets a, that can accompany certain volcanic eruptions, mm-hmm. and I think in some cases you even get some ball lightning, which is really crazy stuff. It's you know, just a ball of lightning that comes and rolls uh-huh. along the ground. I mean, it's and that's why they that's why yeah. they called it an act of God back then when something oh, yeah. like that happened. But <laughs> but I, th- I think it's I think it's God. important that they that we remember it says you know this is lightning lightning like you have never seen. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, have you seen lightning before? Yeah, I've seen. Well, of lightning. course, I've seen lightning before. Uh-huh. You know, lightning you know is not. Uh, I mean, it's impressive. But once you've seen it and you know that you can live through it and it's fine, you know, how do you get lightning like you've never seen before? This is really bad lightning. Mm-hmm. You know, this is this is something spectacular. And it's got to be associated with something that is a different creative phenomenon than what creates the normal lightning. Mm-hmm. So that's one of the geological things um, and, and probably the most important. Mm. There is There are other things that you can do. Uh, and someone reminded me of this just on... Um, this last Sunday, um, the Book of Mormon talks about the famine in the land that Nephi sealed up the heavens and so sealed mm-hmm. the water Helaman, without water. Yeah. You know, you don't feed the plants, and so there's a famine in the land. And we know about the time period that the Book of Mormon says that should have happened. Well, down in the Paten, they have caves that have stalagmites and stalactites, and just like tree rings, they will record different things, and you'll get different, because they're Mm -hmm. water-related, you know, the layers on them, the more water you have, the thicker the layer, et cetera. And so the less water you have, then you, and uh, and you can count them in seasons. Mm Mm-hmm. It just so happens that in these stalactites and stalagmites, down to about the year that Nephi said there was a famine in the land, there's stalactite and stalagmite evidence that says, yeah, there was a famine in the land. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So, and, and where is that? Do you roughly remember, just so I can... 
Uh, oh, where it is it. in the Book of Mormon? Uh, it's in yeah, Hillman. Sure. It's in Hillman. It's when okay, Nephi no gets the power to uh, yeah. seal up everything. Carry on. I'm just uh-huh. going to flip there for myself. Yeah, go ahead. Um, but, I mean, that's a fascinating one. And here's something else that I think is really important for any geography. If someone says, you know, what's the, the, you know, the smoking gun? What's the best thing about it? There isn't one. And there's no single thing because you've got to add this and that. So the, the stalagmite stuff, mm-hmm. that's really impressive. But, but on if its that own, were the, it's if just... we're the only thing we had, mm-hmm. well, okay, that's nice, but. Mm-hmm. But you've got to, you know, you, they, all of this evidence has to start adding together. Okay. And it, the sum has to work. What other geological things are there in the Book of Mormon? <sighs> I think the rest of them are sort of like topographical, where you just have to start looking at the lay of the land. What go, What's up, what's down. Uh, the land of Nephi is always up, and the land of there, Hamla, is always oh, down. Yeah. You're always mm-hmm. going down. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, when Manti is, you know... Uh, in that location where it's you go down from Manti into mm-hmm. Zarahemla, it's likely up into a mountain range, uh, and therefore you know near the headwaters or the head of Sidon. Uh, the Sidon. Well, geology kind of tells you that if you start here and you go there, the water kind of goes down. that mm-hmm. way. <laughs> yeah. Um, which all of the indications are in the Book of Mormon that it should flow north. Um, and you, you have to do some real interesting gymnastics to get yeah. it to go any other direction. And, and I've seen it every other direction possible. I've seen it flowing south to north. Well, south to north is the way it looks like it goes. Uh, I've seen north to south. I have seen east to west. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, like I say, everybody, everybody has to have a riverside in somewhere, and so somewhere. they'll find mm-hmm. one and make whatever yeah. argument they're going to go for it. And just like anything else in the geographic or the geological or ge- yeah the geographic layer, y- you can make your arguments. Mm-hmm. Now, once you get past that and you say, okay, I, I got something, mm-hmm. you know, I got a volcano over here. Now, what do you do? Well, now you get into the human population area. Let's say we have a geography that fits beautifully. We have a volcano that's around close enough that we can do it, and we get to Book of Mormon times and nobody lived there. Mm-hmm. It's a problem. It's a bit of a problem. Mm-hmm. Now, there isn't any place where people didn't live at all, mm-hmm. but the Book of Mormon says there were a whole bunch of people here. So we're not talking, you know, uh, hunter-gatherer tribes. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people there. We're talking about actual cities, civilization. Yeah, and, and for example, in the Baja, um, there's some really cool stuff about the Baja model that really looks good until you get down to the population area, and you say, but nobody really ever lived there. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you can't get that. Now, if you get down to this level, what, what do you do when you get down to the people, <clears throat> when you start looking at who was there? Really, really important thing you have to find is full, full-scale agriculture. Okay? If you don't find full-scale agriculture, you can't support the Book of Mormon. Why? Because of the calories that it requires to feed people. Mm-hmm. If you can't provide calories, you can't support a large population. And anthropologists know this. They'll tell you, you go to hunters and gatherers, and if they're only hunters and gatherers, you can support a population up to maybe 100 or 200 people, and it starts to get too much bigger than that, and you're over hunting and over gathering, and you've got to split up and send people different ways so that they can live off the land because there isn't enough to support you. Yeah, <laughs> makes sense. And, and so, you know, so you, you have these small groups. Then you can have a little bit larger one if you get some sort of incipient ar- uh, agriculture, which, for example, you find among the Hopewell. They had agriculture, but they did not have an agriculture that could sp- supply the caloric intake they needed, and so they had to supplement it with hunter and gatherer. Mm-hmm. Anthropologically, you know that that supports a population of one to 2,000 in that ballpark maybe Mm -hmm. three if you you know Mm -hmm. depending on where you are but you can't support too much more than that in a single population because you have to find something to eat you've got to go hunt you you, your what you grow will not suffice Mm -hmm. i have a question on this before we move on or before you continue is uh, this is actually one of the things I already wrote down that I wanted to ask you about because it always, has always been perplexing to me when considering the Mesoamerican model. And I'm sure there's an answer. What about the migrating beast? So it talks about how 
certain groups of people would move with the migrating beasts in the Book of Mormon. Mm, yeah, no, and it doesn't actually. <laughs> it, no, yeah, no, it, does, it doesn't say that. What it says is there is a famine in the land and the beasts moved to get where the water was. Mm. Uh, which they will do, uh, you know, animals, people, anybody. If if you run out of water where you are, you're going to look for water. You don't, it doesn't really talk about migrations because migrations are cyclical. Yeah. And what you find in the Book of Mormon is a migration that is specifically a single, related a to single a, migration. A, you know, a, a particular event of famine um, where you've got to move them. Yes, um, okay. Okay, that's so, a, yeah, yeah, that's an answer I haven't heard, I haven't heard before. Yeah, well, that's... Closer to the text. Um, yeah, I, I, I just want to find this. We'll, we'll take a, yeah. a little break here because I want I do want to read it because it, it has been a question that I've always yeah I've always had so yeah unless unless I'm remembering it incorrectly which is always a possibility. I found one I found one instance in which it talks about when Alma left uh, he fled from the priest when Abinadi was yeah. being persecuted right and it says. Um, and it came to pass that as many as did believe him did go forth to a place which was called Mormon, having received its name from the king, being in the borders of the land, having been infested by times or at seasons by wild beasts. Right. So, so that's one. So it's, it's talking about at yeah. certain seasons, wild beasts are in that area. Yeah, they come which, to drink the which water. Which su- suggests <laughs> it. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, that's not migration. That's, that's saying, yeah, depending on the season, they're here in this area, and they come to drink the mm-hmm. water, depending on who's there. Um, yeah, it's, migrations are usually much longer and and we certainly assume that they have a larger uh you know population that moves with them mm-hmm. um so we have the bison and the the plains that moved all over yeah um which makes an you know an interesting problem because that's really far away from anything in in the north american model of the book of mormon yeah for sure you know that's that's kind of like out in the area where how would you even know they're migrating because nobody ever went there yeah and so we know of but this anyway. is this is one of the hard things about the text and and one thing that we we've talked about we talked about ad nauseum with uh both kirk magleby and rod meldrum is yeah. that it's it's really hard because there is just like with the bible right oh, there yeah, is yeah, yeah. there's interpretation of text sure. that takes place and oh, there yeah. is an ambiguity where yeah. i can see i could see your point from there and I can totally see the other point where it's like this is talking about sure. migrating beasts, yeah. and that's what's difficult about. Oh yeah, this absolutely, whole and, and right? that's the reason why you cannot say here is the thing. Mm-hmm. If I make so much about migrating beasts, that's good. If that really fits with everything else, mm-hmm. but if I do a really good job on migrating beasts, which is an interpretation, for sure. But I miss Nephite populations, mm-hmm. which I cannot find archaeologically uh, because you know, there was simply no, there were no cities anywhere near the size that, that are, are mentioned. Uh, the other thing is, you know, anthropologi- anthropologically, we know how societies develop. And you don't get kings until you have a certain amount of people. people. So you start off with just an egalitarian group somebody may say you know uh, i'll lead you here or there but you don't necessarily have one you get a little bit larger and they get what they call head man Mm -hmm. and the head man is just somebody who says okay i'll take care of it i'll i'll you know let's all clean up let's do do the execution of the criminals and all yeah (laughs) yeah well yeah and then you'll move from like a head man to a chief, and as the population gets up, then you finally get to a king, but you've got to have a fairly good population to do that. Mm-hmm. Well, Book of Mormon talks about kings all the time. Mm-hmm. And the, when you get to Lamanite, mm-hmm. discussion of the Lamanites, you have kings over kings. I mean, yeah. this is a really big political. You've got to have large populations. Mm-hmm. And Who was the know, first person that was asked to be a king? In the, was it Nephi? I mean, Nephi they, they, was yeah, asked they asked to be Nephi. A king, and, and well, at that time, though, like that's that's the point of like that kind of goes against that point. Well, because there wasn't a lot of people in there yeah, asking them to be a king. It, yeah. Okay, uh, we'll we'll jump into it. Yeah. When you're down on the level of people, you want to look at you know big things like. You know, is is there enough caloric count to support mm-hmm. the populations? Mm-hmm. 
Once you get that and you say, okay, now I've got a plausible place with the Book of Mormon, can I make that, you know, how does it fit? If I put that in history, how well does it work? Yeah. Well, let's start with this one because it really is weird that this early population is asking Nephi to be a king. That's This is really strange. Now, we don't read it as strange mm-hmm. because we're used to kings. We're going to go, oh, of course they wanted to be a king because he king. was a cool guy. Yeah. And so, they came from a place where they, they had a king. They came from a place where they had a king, so obviously they want a king. And then it runs in the face of the idea that there were you know, just Lehi people showing up. You know, there's, Sorensen said, if if we look at let's say um, hangers on and and uh, you know maybe slaves or I don't know they wouldn't be slaves but uh, you know other people unnamed that would have come with Lehi maybe we get thirty people coming across on the yeah. ship and then you split them in half and then very soon Nephi's got a city going well if there's only fifteen people there there's no way you do a king. For sure, it's, it's a little bit strange to say uh, you're a king. Well, it just well, be, it's Dad, more like I'm an calling honorary you Dad. thing. It's probably more like it's probably more a figure of speech. Well, than, and that's I guess the point that I'm saying is it's probably more of a figure of speech or how they conceptualized or, it. Or there's a real reason why it happened. Okay, and the first is that wherever they would have arrived, there were people there. This was not an empty land. Uh, in the Mesoamerican model, most people are going to have them arriving on the uh, Gulf co- or the coast of Guatemala. Mm-hmm. We know that at the time they arrived in on the, the foothills, side, right? on the west side, the Pacific side, we know that in the foothills there were six different, at least six different um, populations of people, villages mm-hmm. of a thousand people each. Mm-hmm. So there's a thousand people, six thousand people. That are basically watching the ocean, and they're going to see a ship with a sail coming across the ocean. Somebody out of those 6,000 people is going to say, what is that? And they're going to show it to somebody else. Because I don't know. I haven't seen anything like that. Do you know what that is? I don't know. It's getting closer. You think something's coming? Yeah, something. Let's go down and see what it is. I, I can guarantee you people met them mm-hmm. when they landed. And with the populations, when they split, and Nephi says, you know, I'm, we've split, and, and you get into second Nephi 5, um, they, they split into the two populations. Nephi names the people who went with him, and, they, and you know, names the people who would stay, and he says, and all the others who would go with me. Well, he's just named pretty much everybody we know. Mm. Who are all the others who would go with me? Well, somebody else who was already there. Mm. Uh, there's multiple things as you go through the text that Just give us clues, clues that there were other people there. So that's First Nephi 20. Yeah. So two, what right? he's referring to is when they split, it says, Wherefore it came to pass that I, Nephi, to take my family and also Zoram and his family and Sam, mine elder brother, and his family and Jacob and Joseph, my younger brethren, and also my sisters and all they which would go with me. Yeah. And all and all they which would go with me were they which believed in the warnings and the revelations of God. Yeah. Okay. So that that's interesting. Yeah, because and he could have just ended with all the specific which families that he said. Yeah, right? and, all and, and he named everybody people. that we can think of that he could have named. I mean, the ones he so doesn't name, we kind they? of know they were anti-Nephi anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Laman didn't go. Yeah, big surprise. Yeah. You know, no Laman, no Lemuel. <laughs> Uh, their wives and children. Yeah, their wives and children. Of course they're not going to go. Uh, so who is all these others? That's, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. I, I've never, now, I never read it like that. That's cool. Back into that, what's happening in Mesoamerica at that time period? At that time period in Mesoamerica, we are in a time, in, in there's about 100 years period of time here where there's being a shift away from chieftains and into kingships. Mm-hmm. And so are the people in the area in that Mesoamerican region mm. are developing kingships. Uh, and so kings are rising. Mm-hmm. So why does his people want him to be king? Well, they've got a king. How come we can't have a king? Mm-hmm. Because they were making kings. It was a big thing at the time. It was an expect expectation. So if you put the Book of Mormon in that place at that time, the people requesting Nephi to be a king isn't all surprising at all. It, it fits into known history. And is that history documented? How is that documented, or how, how can we? Archaeologists will do that. The that. one I remember, um, and I don't remember who wrote with him, but uh, John Clark okay. um, has done a lot of work on um, on the early history, and he, 
that I think that's I'm pretty sure that's where I got my information okay. was from the article yeah, that he wrote. Okay, cool. there, there's another one that you know as you move through you get to Jacob, and you get Jacob who excoriates his people for two things, which is polygamy and wearing fine apparel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we know that, and we go, oh, yeah, of course he does that. Well, why those two things? And where are they getting all these women, too? You know what I mean? To, like, oh, if yeah. Because they're, if, they're, if it's just these people. Yeah, we're talking some it's just wild one incest gen- it's just here, one, folks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's just one generation, right? Yeah. Jacob, Jacob came yeah. over on the boat. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's on the ship, I guess. And yeah. I tried to do the math the other day. I was like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> there, there's lots just, of babies. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. no. Yeah. If you're not, and there's other things in the text that don't make sense unless you are saying there's somebody else. There's some there's, assimilate, uh, assimilation. And, and which one people. this is, I don't remember where now, but uh, Nephi tells Jacob to preach, and he gives him a text out of Isaiah. Shocking. Mm-hmm. Nephi says, you know, preach Isaiah to the people. And so he gives them a verse out of Isaiah that talks about the Gentiles saving the house of Israel. You know, they're going to be your nursing fathers and your nursing mothers. They're going to carry you on your shoulders. And the Gentiles are going to be your savior. Okay, now we, we read that kind of thing and we're going, well, in the New World, that's when, you know, Columbus arrives. Yeah. Well, that doesn't <laughs> Yeah, do... they weren't really their saviors at that time. They kind no, of messed them I up. No, I mean, and, and <laughs> why do you tell a people, I'm going to give you a verse that really has absolutely nothing to do with you for 3,000 years, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. What, what is that? Well, the Gentiles are these people who were already there. And it says, they're your salvation. They're your squanto that is going to teach you how to do what you need to do. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when the people of Nephi come over, who, who was the potter? Mm-hmm. Who was the guy who knew how to make plates, yeah. pots? None of them. I mean, they knew how to smelt metal. But uh, the people that they came into didn't really care about that. Yeah. You know, the it, this is super. It, these are interesting textual things. I, I haven't they haven't been pointed out to me in this. Yeah. Like this and, before. and what you do is you take them and then you go, OK, let's set the Book of Mormon against this location and the known history and then watch it go through time. So you don't say, oh, well, here's a piece. There's a piece. Let's throw them all together and pretend that this works. Mm-hmm. Take it through time, you know, because mm-hmm. when they're in the land of Nephi, it's earlier than the end of the Book of Mormon. It's also a very different people. It's a different culture. And so as you start moving things through time, what do you find? Well, let's take uh, the time when Mosiah, the, fa- the grandfather, so Mosiah 1, who's the father of Benjamin, who's the father of Mosiah 2. Mm-hmm. So when this first Mosiah leaves the land of Nephi, you know, there's apparently, you know, some Lamanite invasion. The bad guys are coming. They're kicking us out. He takes everybody who would go with him. And I think Mormon intentionally writes that story to make sure that it parallels the journey of Lehi so that Mormon is saying, by the way, you know, we're starting over again. So they leave. They go down into the land of Zarahemla and they meet uh, the, the Mulekites there, and it says they don't speak the same language. Okay, we know the story. As an anthropologist, I look at that and I say, okay, there's something wrong with this story because languages do not change that fast. We've only had 400 years. You do not have a language change from the common language that you had so that 400 years later it's mutually unintelligible. Mm-hmm. Especially if it's just speaking. Like with English, you read a Tinsdale Bible and you're yeah. like, that doesn't make any sense. But right. if you heard them talk, it would have been it would have been weird, kinda like Scottish today, a little bit to yeah. us, you know. There, but there <laughs> are things that, that would be close. Uh-huh. You know, things that would be close. But not totally mutually unintelligible. I mean, you know, again, you go back to the Tinsdale Bible and you're going to go, okay, I don't know that word. I don't know this word. But yeah, that one I know. And this Mm -hmm. one I know. Or I could, Mm -hmm. yeah, but totally mutually unintelligible. You just don't change that fast. So how would it happen that they did? Well, if the Melekites came and went with somebody else and met them, Mm -hmm. uh, then they would learn a language, right? Mm -hmm. And the Nephites would have done the same thing. And it's entirely possible to be bilingual. Um... So what happens is, what it seems, is that you get two people speaking two different languages. And it says also that they lost their religion, so the gods are different. Mm. Okay? 
Well, what happens if you put that into time? What we know archaeologically is that there was a group coming from the Gulf of Mexico and heading south down the Grijalva River Valley during the years that the Mulekites would have been making that journey to get to the land of Zarahemla. So the time periods are very close. Mm -hmm. The language group we know in that area was Soke. So we have these Soke speakers that are coming down. So apart from the Book of Mormon, you know, we know that Soke speakers are coming down. We also have evidence that there are some Maya speakers who have at least met them, mm -hmm. uh, and you show up there. So what would happen if Maya speakers show up with Soke speakers in the, you know, the Grijalva River Valley? They wouldn't understand They couldn't other. understand each other. Mm -hmm. Those are mutually unintelligible languages. Now, there were some differences among Maya, but those were dialectical. Mm -hmm. uh, there are dialects, you know, in the Soke, but Soke and Maya are mutually unintelligible. Interesting. So the archaeology tells us that we had this group coming down. Uh, the Book of Mormon says they couldn't, and we have the perfect explanation, and the time period fits. Mm -hmm. So we go, okay, wait. So with Nephi, we've got the reason why he's a king, and that all fits with that time period. But that's over, because now it's all now it's kings, uh -huh. and we don't hear about that anymore. <clears throat> and so now we get into this one, and we have you know this location, and again, we've got time period, and things are matching up. Um, so that's going to fit. Then... Um, once you have some of these big pieces together, you can get, you know, like little pieces. One that, that Mark Wright's fond of um, is Alma telling the people in Zarahemla, you know, have, do you have the image of God engraven upon your faces? Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a cool image. We like that. We mm -hmm. quote that a lot. A lot. But it is a weird image. Mm -hmm. Engraven? Who's engraven cutting into my face? Your face. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, in that area of the world... Uh, the people actually wore masks that they would put on and become the God. And they would put the image of God on their face, literally. Mm -hmm. It's like, you got your mask on? And they on carved it. <laughs> yeah. And they carved it. And so when he says, you know, have you put the image of the right God on your face? Mm -hmm. Because some of them may have put the image of a different God on their face. Mm -hmm. So have you the image of Yahweh written mm -hmm. on your face? Yeah. And because we just use the generic word God, we miss the fact that it is highly likely that he's saying about Yahweh. this God, you know, mm -hmm. and, and go back to um, Israel in the old world. Uh, you know, when they say God, they mean Yahweh. Mm -hmm. um, but they knew that other people had other gods. And so yeah. it wasn't, you know, that's super interesting. You, you had to know the, which God it was. Okay. So that one fits. Yeah. I, I a question before we, because I, yeah. I think we're going to keep moving on to all this uh, uh, other awesome stuff. What, as we're talking about writing and language and stuff like that, one thing that I've always found difficult when it comes to the Mesoamerican th theory for me is that the style of writing and the style of art and architecture is so different from an Israelite style of writing and architecture. Mm -hmm. it, it's It's hard for me to think that because a lot of the things that date to around that time, it's like, it seems very unlikely to me that it would change so drastically, uh, and why would it change so quickly? Yeah, and that's you know? an excellent question, and it goes back to the fact that there were people here mm -hmm. when they showed up. So, but why would they, why would, uh, especially coming from like an Israelite background where well, they let's shun talk the about Canaanites, that. why would they let's, adopt let, other people's Let's talk stuff? about that. Let's yeah. talk about that, because that's again important, and we forget this. Mm -hmm. Let's just talk about art. <clears throat> and uh, Israel. Israel is famously aniconic, meaning mm -hmm. they don't want representations of God. Mm -hmm. They don't do many representations of much of anything. What kind of architecture do you have in Israel? Well, it depends on who was dominating them at the time. So um, Solomon's temple is highly influenced by Assyrian temples. Uh, because the Assyrians were kind of influential at the time. Uh, other temples are going to be, you know, other time periods are influenced by other people around them. So there's a lot of culture that they're getting from someone else that isn't purely Israelite. Um, and then, of course, 
the farther along you go, the more image is being borrowed from someone else. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then you get into the whole idea of Christian iconography and early Christian iconography is all borrowed from the Greeks. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I hear frequently about the Book of Mormon is, well, the Book of Mormon says it's Christian, but where are the Christian art? Mm -hmm. Oh, you mean the Greek art? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, it's just, it's not there because it should not be there. So let's go to the writing. Uh, we really think that we should find, you know, some Hebrew, and uh, perhaps that would happen. Mm-hmm. There's two things, however. The Book of Mormon specifically says that it has something to do with Egyptian and then something to do with Reformed Egyptian. Mm-hmm. We don't know what Reformed According Egyptian is. According to the learning is. of the Jews. It, yeah, we, we but have they no speak idea. the language of Egyptian. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and... and it, uh, Mosiah is telling his sons, or no, Benjamin is telling his sons that they should learn Egyptian so they can read the brass plates. So Egyptian is in there somewhere. Mm-hmm. Okay, now it's not hieroglyphics at the time, it's demotic. Um, but is there anything about Egyptian and the writing systems that we see in Mesoamerica that would allow us to say, well, I wonder why someone would conflate those do they have anything in in common they're syllabic they're not alphabetic so um you you would have a character for ba a different character for bay a Mm -hmm. different character for Mm bow and so all you know in our alphabetic we'd have the b and then the vowels Mm -hmm. but they would have the syllable put together and it would be a different Mm -hmm. and the egyptian does that and maya does that and the language Mm -hmm. is down there so you know from a language standpoint is it that different like structurally i i see that yeah for sure. not not entirely mm-hmm. now what about the fact that they probably wrote in hebrew one of the problems of of just everything in the new world and particularly for those of us who who try to study mesoamerica the land eats things mm-hmm. now the book of mormon says if you don't put it on plates it's going to perish mm. well that's actually true down there. If you put it on a perishable material, it will perish. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, the, the Spaniards burned a lot of them, and they perished that way, but mm-hmm. there weren't very many things that we find in these archaeological sites. Stone, Be- stone and metal, that's what's going to last. Stone and metal are going to last. And so we don't get much written on metal uh, until much later. They did not really start writing on stone until about A.D. 400. Well, that's about the end of the Book of Mormon. That's not Book of Mormon times. Now, did they start writing? Was that the invention of writing? Well, everybody knows that the answer to that is no. But now we have better evidence because they found the site of San Bartolo. And this is a place where San the guy Bartolo. accidentally finds this cave, sort of goes into it, and lo and behold, it's a temple. And the walls are painted, not carved in stone. Hmm. And it's old enough that the glyphs there, you can read some of them, but you can't read all of them uh, because they've shifted over time. But what it tells us is that people painted before they carved. And so if you are writing on perishable material, and we know in Ammonihah they burned books, so there was a perishable material there, they're gone. So... How much Hebrew writing would they have had if they wrote on the perishable material? If they didn't get around to putting it either on metal or either on stone, it, mm-hmm. it's gone. Mm-hmm. And the Book of Mormon says that's happened, and the actual history of that area tells us that that's happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's not that we don't think there was ever anything there, because we do have the evidence mm-hmm. you know, that it was developing. But if it was perishable, it, it's mm-hmm. gone. Yeah, it's just, I, I guess one of the the big things too, especially when it comes to the iconography, is uh, there there very much are, and that that's the thing is I don't know the the full breadth of your Mesoamerican model and what your claims are, and I know because yeah, I, yeah. there's a lot of variety, right? Sure. And you know we've talked to people that point out the iconography and the and the writing and stuff, and they're like, oh, this is talking about. The Book of Mormon to this is that, and yeah, it's just uh, the thing that's hard is you know Israelites. They, they were a law of Moses following yeah. people until Christ said, law, law right. Moses done. And so the idea of them graving images of, of God, of Yahweh, it just seems unlikely. Yeah. Um, and one of the things I pointed out, boy, I think way back when I was doing the commentary on this, I, I hold to pretty close to the Sorensen model. Mm-hmm. I, I don't disagree with him too much. Uh, mm-hmm. Where he and I first disagreed was on 
the Jaredite landing place. He had them on the west coast, and I have them in the, in the uh, Gulf Coast of Mexico. Mexico. But he changed that by the time he got to uh, Mormon's Codex, so we mm-hmm. don't have that disagreement anymore. Mm-hmm. And I don't worry about specific locations ones, because yeah. I'm looking at cultural connections. Mm-hmm. But here's the one for you. If you're using that model and you're saying, let's go into the Grijalva River Valley, you go to most places and what you will find on the temples are masks of the gods. When you get to the culture area right along that Grijalva River Valley, they're interestingly aniconic. We don't find the masks of the gods there. We don't find a lot of uh, iconography in the pottery. We'll find a few things that people brought in from somewhere else. But they're not a people that is doing much to sort of represent Mm -hmm. the gods. Gods. Mm -hmm. So when you go back to what you were saying, you know, (laughs) know, here are people that probably shouldn't be doing that. Mm -hmm. Oh, right where we've got Nephites, all of a sudden this is the place where we're finding the least amount of iconography. iconography. So, yeah, I'd say, yeah, that's probably about true and Mm -hmm. at least from the way all these things fit together uh, that fits pretty well you know from what uh, from what i'm looking at sure um now other kinds of things what's another one what's another big evidence of well here here is the biggest and i i think this one is now gaining at least with anybody dealing with mesoamerica is gaining some traction Mm. uh, which is uh the end of the book of mormon we all know the Book of Mormon ends. I mean, this is not surprising. Mm-hmm. Uh, we all know that the people die. We just never asked ourselves, why then? You know, we just, well, of course, it, it, they died more and said so. Mm-hmm. But things don't happen like that in the real world. Real history has causation. Mm-hmm. And if people are going to die off, there's going to be a reason for it. Now, in addition to that, this is a war of destruction, those are the most expensive kinds, mm-hmm. and you it's tend not to warfare. get them. You mm-hmm. know, and most of the warfare that you see throughout the Book of Mormon is a warfare that is trying to preserve the people they conquer, so that the people they conquer will give them tribute, tribute. and taxes. Mm-hmm. You know, very famously in uh, the story of uh, you know um, Limhi, uh, Zenith and Limhi, where they're you know giving taxes to the Lamanites around them. Now that that's what everybody wants to set up. Mm-hmm. So to say, look, I'm just going to wipe you out, mm-hmm. you've got to have a really, really good reason for doing that because this is a tough war to do. You've got to have a large army. You've got to put them in the field. You've got to supply them. You've got to hunt people down instead of saying, yeah, why don't you guys just stay on the farms and give us stuff? Mm-hmm. You know? So you know, you know, this is a known difficulty. And at the end of the Book of Mormon, all of a sudden we're saying, contrary to every other war, that we know about in the Book of Mormon, this one is a war of destruction. Mm -hmm. It's the only one that's the war of destruction, and it works. Well, what's behind that? Why? Well, it just so happens that at the time period right around the end of the Book of Mormon is when Tatiwakan is uh, creating its economic ties with cities in um, the... Maya lowlands and in order to get to the Maya lowlands you go from central Mexico and you pretty much travel the coast down is the main way to get there going through the isthmus of Tehuantepec which would be the narrow neck of land and then eventually you get down and you create these ties and we actually have records and texts telling us that somebody from Teotihuacan comes down and uh, has what they call an entrada Basically, it means hey, we came and we conquered you. Um, there's all kinds of euphemisms that they'll put on these things. But basically, Teotihuacan comes down, they conquer Tikal, yes. but they don't eradicate it. They keep people there, and they say, pay us tribute. But what's happening is you have somebody in central Mexico, somebody down here, that is now creating a very important economic trade route. Mm-hmm. Guess who's sitting on the bottleneck of that trade route going that, through the narrow neck of land? Who's be the there? Maya. The Nephites. Or the Nephites, yeah. Because the bountiful, Nephites right? are the ones who were there. And they're famously, uh, you know, enemies too. And they're sitting right on the trade routes. Okay, all of a sudden you have really big, powerful people on both sides 
that are saying, okay, these guys are now a problem and they're a big enough problem and could be a big enough problem that it's worth getting rid of it. So all of a sudden those situations surrounding it tell us why it's only at that point in time that we have the Book of Mormon ending on um, all of the wars we've seen before. Mm-hmm. Now, there's other things in there. Uh, in particular, um, I've made the argument multiple times now that Mormon intentionally points the Gadianton robbers towards Tetuacan. He he links them up. Now, he doesn't give the name of the city, but he talks about it being in the north and coming from the north, and there's all kinds of reasons why. Mm-hmm. But you'll also remember that when Mormon talks about why the Book of Mormon ends, it's not the Lamanites. It's the Gadianton robbers. And in one of the books in Helaman, he says, I will show you at the end of this yeah. book, not the end of he- book the book of Helaman. at the end of this book. But at the end of this book, I will show you that it's the Gadianton robbers who have destroyed Cause us. The destruction. And so he talks about this one time when there's a war, you know, and, then, and his father, Mormon's father, was a general, and he had fought. And so they, they come and they fight and, and they win. And you know, we get a lot of Nephite winning mm-hmm. in the Book of Mormon, you know. He says, and then they saw the Lamanites there, and they just turned tail and ran. Huh? I saw Gadianton robbers, and that made a difference. Mm-hmm. And it talks about the Gadianton robbers infesting the, the land. land. And Well, the military uniforms, if you will, of the Teotihuacanos was very distinct. We, can, you know, we see it on iconography. We can recognize it. Mm-hmm. We know when it shows up. And there were a few military... Um, tools they had or weapons they had that uh, that changed warfare and they were just dominant and I, I think that's what Mormon's talking about and he's saying yeah the Gadiantans came down everything changed when the Gadiantans came down and Gadiantans were the ones that got rid of us and it just so happens that that's exactly the time period when Tehuacan is coming down and making war on these places and conquering them. That's interesting. You, do you write about that extensively in your books? Yes. Oh, I got to get your books, man. Yeah. The, the one you, <laughs> yeah, the one book you want to read is called Traditions of the Fathers. The Book of Mormon is history, and okay. so everything I've been saying about let's let's take this and go slowly through time and yeah. watch it. How does this correlate? You know, with what we know is happening in the world. So after that's the book I need to get. That's the okay. book you want okay. is cool. uh, the traditions of the fathers. Interesting. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. I uh, I wanted to ask. But we'll, we'll kind of uh, transition a little bit. What? How? I, I, I sorry. One second. I have a I question. Have you go. Your question. Um, <laughs> with with John Sorson okay. and uh, kind of your similar and mutual beliefs. Do you also hold the belief that kind of all statements made by Joseph Smith in regards to geography and stuff like that um, were more his just opinion and best guess instead of uh, yeah him um, speaking prophetically right because if if Joseph Smith had made a thus saith the Lord pronouncement you would expect that somebody would have known. Mm-hmm. And all of the apostles and close associates seem to have had a wide range of things they believed. Uh, Orson Pratt certainly should have known. Mm-hmm. And Orson Pratt believed in a hemispheric model. In the footnotes that he put into the 1879 edition of the yep. Book of Mormon, it's all hemispheric and, and has the Nephites in, in northern South America. Mm. None of us believe that anymore, and they took all those footnotes out. But, you know, Orson should have known. You know, if, if Joseph had really pronounced it, you know, how did Orson get it wrong? Mm-hmm. Well, Joseph, I, and I've heard Mesoamericanists make, I think, too much out of the Stevenson Catherwood's book. Yeah. Um, I think what happens is that's shown to Joseph, and everybody says, oh, man, those are really cool ruins. They must be Nephite ruins. Mm. And they get all excited about them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They don't know anything about them. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think they said, uh, what was it, Copan should be. Zarahemla. Mm-hmm. Well, that's an interesting idea, mm-hmm. but wrong geography but and wrong know? time yeah. period. Uh-huh. I mean, Copan wasn't there. They just there. see cool pictures that were that they were drawn saw in cool there pictures, and and, and 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 they weren't very sophisticated. These were not mm-hmm. educated people. Mm-hmm. Now, how does Joseph say these things? You know, first of all, he's a prophet, and he did get visions. So, how does he get it wrong if he got visions? Have you ever taken a 
a ge- sort of a geography test on the internet where they say, here's a picture of a place. Mm-hmm. Where is that place? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've seen those. There's like people on Google Maps that can like find anywhere in the world. Like if you take a selfie somewhere, they'll find it on Google Maps. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But I, I took one once, and there were a couple of them when I, when I said, you know, I'm going to get this one right because I can see it has Japanese characters. But, you know, if they didn't have the sign in Japanese, there's no way I would have known that that was, you know, in anywhere Japan. near Japan. Yeah. Uh, you know, because grass looks like grass, and if you get a deciduous tree, it kind of looks like a deciduous tree. Yeah. Um, I've been in the Chiapas Valley, which is where I think a lot of the things in the Book of Mormon took place, and it's not the jungle. It's it's mountains, it's trees. I've lived in New York. You know, it's not that different. Mm-hmm. If somebody took a picture there and took a picture of New York and said, these trees are these trees, where are they? Be hard. I don't know. Yeah. So if what Joseph is seeing in a vision is helping him to understand what the people were like because he could see them, I think that tells him what he needs to know. I don't think it tells him a place. But he didn't necessarily have a zoomed out. like. No. I know. I think Google Google Earth has really screwed all of us up a little bit, you know? <laughs> we don't understand that there was literally a boots on the ground type deal. Like oh, yeah. Every, their yeah. description of geographies and stuff was... From how they saw it. Right? Oh, absolutely, and, and yeah, it, it, you and know, even, look at even some really ancient maps. I mean, mm-hmm. you look at Mesoamerican maps, and Mesoamerican maps will show you here's four mountains, and we're in here, and you try to match that up with the real world. Well, <laughs> which four mountains? There's mountains all over the place, <laughs> but you know these were four sacred yeah. ones. And, you know, if you For don't sure. know which one they're looking at. Yeah, I have a friend of mine that went to the Philippines on a mission, and he was a nurse, and so he was you know in the mission home, and they're in Manila. And this is 10 years ago, not that long ago. And he got one of the local members because they needed to go someplace in Manila. And the guy hadn't been there before, knew the city really well, basically. But he said, and so they pulled out a map and they said, okay, well, here's what. And the guy was dumbfounded. He had no idea what that was. He, he'd never seen a map before. And, you know, he'd driven through the city, but he hadn't seen map of the city. Mm-hmm. And they had to explain to him, well, pretend you were a bird flying over and that's what you're seeing. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Mm-hmm. This is 10 years ago. You mm-hmm. know, think about way back when, when you don't have maps and you don't have all these other kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're, how do you know where something is? Well, it's, I walked this, I walked for three or four days before I got there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's how I know. Uh, you know, there's no street signs. <laughs> you know, yeah, just, for sure. No, that, that makes sense. Yeah. And I, I think uh, yeah, I, I was always, there recently, because we asked the same question to Rod Meldrum. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's one thing that we try to do on, on this show is we like to ask the same question to multiple people, oh, yeah, yeah. see what their answers are, sure. and then hear what the other people say, right? Yeah. And so he gave, he gave an answer that we hadn't heard before, and it has to do with a letter that was sent. Do you, ha- do you have that yeah, with so you? Yeah, apparently, and... Because I, I, it was my last time that we talked to him, it was my persuasion too. Joseph Smith never said anything, like, prophetically, it, it was always like, it, it, yeah, there wasn't anything that was like solid evidence. And then he presented this, and I want to get your thoughts on it. Oh, because is this, I mean, Wentworth letter? No, this isn't Wentworth oh. letter. No, this is something so separate. Th- this is Which something one? that comes out. It's called the American Revivalist Account. And essentially, it says, in 1833, Joe Smith penned a letter to the editor of the American Revivalist and Rochester Observer in which he described the Book of Mormon in the following. He says, The Book of Mormon is a record of the forefathers of our Western tribes of Indians. By it, we learn that our Western tribes of Indians are descendants from from Mm -hmm. that Joseph that was sold into Egypt, and that the land of America is a promised land unto them. And then it says the editor um, published a portion of the letter from Joseph Smith in the article titled Mormonism in the paper on the 2nd of February, 1833. 10 days later, Joseph penned another letter indicating his disappointment at having received the paper and finding his original letter had not been printed in its entirety. And he goes on to write the letter back. He says, Dear Sir, I was somewhat disappointed on receiving my paper with only a part of my letter inserted in it. The letter which I wrote to you for publication I wrote by the commandment of God and I am quite anxious to have it all laid out before the public for it is important to them and so essentially what he's saying is at that time their perspective of the western tribes of the Indians their 
you know, in Rochester, New York. Kind sure. Of the and so, mm-hmm. oh yeah, it's yeah, and, it, and he makes it seem like it was like because it, it, I guess the phrase in there that Rod pointed out that's like he's like this is a smoking gun as it says I sent this to you by the commandment of God, right. and so he 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 makes yeah. the claim that that's the prophetic sure expand. Oh, what of are your, you yeah, so what are your yeah what are your thoughts on? Sending a letter by commandment is different from the content of the letter. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. so I would say, yeah, you know, he, God says send them a letter, and Joseph writes the letter and sends it off. Mm-hmm. Did Joseph think that at that point in time? Absolutely certain he mm-hmm. did. Okay. Now the question is, if he thought that at that time, how could he have possibly changed his mind and got excited about the Stevens and Catherwood book? Mm-hmm. You know, if if Joseph had a revelation and Joseph said this is the only place the Book of Mormon could be. How did he change his mind? Mm-hmm. Well, because it wasn't revelation to start with. This mm-hmm. is all speculation. Uh, all of the speculation they have early on is because what they know is the Western Indians. And so you get uh, a lot of reliance in the early church on Josiah Priest uh, because he wrote a book that talked about how all of that worked. Mm -hmm. Uh, And there are books, um, Josiah Priest is one of them. um, I can't remember the author. I can't remember the name. Mm -hmm. (sighs) Somewhere in that traditions book when I'm looking at the origins (laughs) of stuff. (laughs) Uh, But there's there's things in there where everybody is trying to find Hebrew, and they do. Mm -hmm. You know, you find the... um, you know, like the the you know the uh, a chant of Yahweh or Jehovah, you know they're mm-hmm. chanting Jehovah. Not if you're a linguist. <laughs> if mm-hmm. you're a linguist and you're looking at this, you're going, yeah, here's somebody who didn't know what they were listening to and made it up. Yeah. Um, and, and there's a lot of that kind of thing, but but very clearly, Joseph, early people believed that it was going to be the Western. Indians because that's all they knew. Yeah, I'm gone, going, and then yeah. when other things became an option, mm-hmm. that became an option. And I don't think they open. ever jettisoned their ideas about North America. Uh, I yeah. think they always thought that that was part of it. But things mm-hmm. moved because all of a sudden we had more spectacular ruins. Sure. Um, yeah. I get, yeah, I get what you're saying. Now, I'm thinking about this now. I never had this thought before, but when the Stephen Catherwood stuff came out, Joseph also never gave like a um, a definitive statement that like refer or affirmed that reaffirmed that the Book of Mormon happened in North America. So yeah, even no. even though I know that the Stephen Catherwood Catherwood thing, it's it's still not super clear cut, right? It, there's still yeah, and there's that's still where I get a little unhappy with the Mesoamericans who say, "Oh, look, Joseph said like that their, it was down here." Their hinge point it's like or it's whatever. not in his handwriting. Yeah. It's not well, he, it's, pen or whatever. Yeah. It, yeah, it doesn't matter because. Mm-hmm. Joseph would have accepted that just as easily accept anything else. Joseph was not critical about these things. Mm-hmm. Nobody was at the time. They yeah. were they were not trained in these areas. There's no history. There's very little archaeology. Mm-hmm. Nobody tries to match up time periods and locations. Uh, you know, up until shoot easily the 1950s. Uh, you know, we're getting uh, every hole in the ground is a baptismal font. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. the Ancient America Speaks uh, mm-hmm. uh, film that I was talking about, the reason the archaeologists laugh at that is because it pulled any time period, any location. If this looked cool, then it we'll fa- put it in there. And, yeah. yeah, and so you'd get something from South America and Mesoamerica and North America, and there's just no way the Book of Mormon covers that, that length of time. Mm-hmm. But this was into the 1950s. Mm-hmm. We just weren't that critical. We, mm-hmm. you know, we just, uh, we, we didn't know. They didn't know. The science wasn't there. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Joseph had bigger fish to fry. Now that I'm thinking about it, it's just like at that time, the endowment and the temple was being worked on. Oh, also, yeah. he knew he was running for president around. He was, <laughs> he was going to make a run for president here yeah. soon around that time that the whole uh, Times and Seasons, Stephen yeah, Catherwood yeah. thing happened. So it's just, I, I yeah, I think... I just, yeah, I love this. This has been a really awesome conversation. My question is, so then is just kind of the, I mean, we know one definitive thing about the Book of Mormon. It's where the plates were found, right? So then is the belief that oh, yeah. no, Moroni. <laughs> let's talk about Yeah, let's, Moroni, let's have it be our finishing thing. Is well, you know, we might as well finish it. And, and let's be accurate. And this one I can give okay. you a verse to read. Okay. 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 Mormon 6-6. Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh, yes. That's Mormon 6-6. 
perplexes me because it does me too. Oh, well, let me read it for for the viewers. Yeah. So Mormon six six it says, and it came to pass that when we had gathered all our people in the land of Camorra, behold, I Mormon began to be old, and knowing it would be the last struggle of my people, and having been commanded of the Lord that I should not suffer that the records which had been handed down by our fathers, which were sacred, to fall into the hands of the Lamanites. For the Lamanites would destroy them. Therefore, I made this record out of the plates of Nephi and hid up in the hill Cumorah all the records which had been entrusted to me by the hand of the Lord, save it were these few plates which I gave unto my son Moroni. So essentially saying that he buried all the other plates that he abridged from yeah, and he buried those in the hill Cumorah except for the ones that he passed on to Moroni. That's exactly what it says. So okay. he, these are the this is the Nephite archive that he took out of the hill shim. So Amaron says I'm, I hid them up in the hill shim. Okay, you he gets take them out. them out when you're 24 and you know be the, the historian. Mm-hmm. And then he's and he does and Mormon kind of messes up the history there and he he has to insert some things later because he forgot to tell us that he went there when he was 24. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we don't get him going by the hill shim until he's much older. But he goes by the hill shim. He says, you know, then, you know the, the Lamanites are going to take over this thing. I got to get these records out of here. So he takes everything in the entire Nephite archive mm-hmm. comes out. Mm-hmm. And so that's what he has with him is the entire Nephite archive, small plates, large plates, brass plates, all of this record. Everything. Everything. And he says, and I buried it in the hill Cumorah. Everything. Mm-hmm. Except for the Book of Mormon, because mm-hmm. that's the plates he gave to his son Nephi or Moroni. Those are the plates that Moroni wrote in. You know, added the Book of Ether to and added the Book of Moroni to. Mm-hmm. A lot of stuff. So, according to the Book of Mormon, the plates that Joseph got were never buried in the Hill Cumorah. It just were buried. According in a hill. to the Book of Mormon, all the text we have. Mm-hmm. It says they were not in the Hill Camorra. Now, you can say, well, they came back and buried them. But it doesn't say but that. But it doesn't say that. And that's, that's what I say to the Heartlanders all the time. Is just like, okay, you can say all these things, but the text never says Camorra. Right. No. Mm-hmm. It, it, and rather specifically says it isn't. Mm-hmm. So how, how now, how that? do you get there? Huh? How do you no. mean it specifically says it isn't? Because oh. there's an omission. I buried every, yeah, I buried everything except these plates. It specifically says that these plates are not buried with everything else in Camorra. Okay. Now. Does does that preclude him from coming Doing back? The loop, yeah, that's what that's what I'm talking well, about. Well, no, okay. it doesn't preclude him from that. It just says. But why wouldn't he say? Why wouldn't he say he went back to the hill? Well, think bury, about right? think about that's, this. That's what I think. At the, at the end, he says, "Okay, we're being hunted. My father and a few people go south, and I'm going north." And he hears from his father in the south that he's been killed. Nephi's up in the north. Or They're Moroni. killing people in the south. The farther north you go, the safer you are. I'm going to loop back around to an unsafe place, mm-hmm. and I'm going to bury these plates. Mm-hmm. You know, he's, he's probably not coming back because this is now in somebody else's hands. Uh, so, I mean, logically, there isn't any good reason for him to go there. I agree with you on that. Historically, um, there's some historians who've looked at this trying to find when Joseph himself called the hill Cumorah, and mm-hmm. it was like the 1840s. Mm-hmm. We just don't have him prior to that time. And Joseph adopted language mm-hmm. that everybody was else was using. So, I, I mean, if everybody else called it that, Joseph did. But it took him a while to do it. Now, let's talk about the hill Cumorah that's in New York. Mm-hmm. The plates were taken out of that hill. Mm-hmm. It was called Mormon Hill for a long time uh, afterwards, not Camorra. Camorra was a later thing. Uh, the saints would call it Camorra. Um, you know, S- Joseph certainly didn't call it that early on. It appears that Oliver did. But that's the historical problem of naming. Let's look at the geographic problem. Mm-hmm. <sighs> According to the Book of Mormon, um, everybody ends at the Hill Camorra, and it's north of um, the narrow neck of land and near the eastern seaboard. Mm-hmm. Well, the Hill Camorra in New York isn't close to any eastern body of water, not very close at all. 
And the most common narrow neck of land is north of, not south of, the Hill Cumorah. It's northwest. So the whole idea that they went through the narrow neck of land to get to Cumorah, which is what the text says, doesn't fit the geography of New York. You know, south of the Hill Cumorah, where do you find a narrow neck? You've got to have one, and it can't be terribly far away. Um, I don't know where it is. Mm-hmm. I, I can't find it. Usually it's somewhere around the Great Lakes is where the Great Lake People hypotheses say, yeah. or the heartland will, will put it. Mm-hmm. But that's all to the north, mm-hmm. and it's supposed to be south. Mm-hmm. So um, you, you have a name that is the reason why you make that identification. Um, it is contrary to what the text says. What is the support for that name? Tradition. Mm-hmm. And there's a long tradition, and absolutely a lot of people believed that for a very, very long period sure. of time. Mm-hmm. Was it ever correct? I don't know. Yeah. You know. Interesting. I, I think one thing I will point out, because we I've talked to different people that believe in the Mesoamerican theory, and they're like, the Hill Cumorah has to be way bigger. Like, And they'll point out like these giant mountains down in Central America, and they're like, yeah. this is what we think. And I'm like, it talks about mountains in the Book of Mormon. Mount Antipas, for example. If it was a mountain, it would probably say mountain, but it specifically yeah. says uh, hill, hill in here. Yeah. And so that's one thing I get frustrated because they're like, oh, this is Arkham Moore. And I'm like, that's a mountain, not not a hill. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? So then the assumption, I guess, to go back to my question that Moroni packed up the plates and he h- hightailed it up. Yeah. And buried it there. Cool. Okay. Yeah, and, and John Swanson found an account of somebody who had made a similar turn, journey, a solo sailor that, you know, was shipwrecked in Central America and walked to New York. Oh, so, gosh. <laughs> That's a long walk. Oh, yeah, it's a long yeah, walk. I mean, but, I mean, it's, it a, it's, you know, it's, it's documented historically. So when someone says, could Moroni have done that? Mm-hmm. Well, okay, this guy did it, so Moroni could have mm-hmm. done it. Yeah, is it possible? That's sure, it's possible. Which of Sorensen's books do you think? Uh, that we that, have that a, one I know is in ancient, um, ancient America... An ancient American setting for the Book of Mormon. Okay, okay, cool. Well, this has been awesome. I really appreciate you coming in and sharing all of this. I hope all of you that are watching just open your minds and consider this. And I know that this the, the Book of Mormon geography is hotly debated, and sometimes people can get very emotional about <laughs> it. I hope that we can leave the emotions at the door and just think about the possibilities. And at the end of the day, you believe that the Book of Mormon is a testament of Jesus Christ. Absolutely. That it's a historical book. Yes. And I know that the majority, except for the, all the critics that watch us, believe <laughs> that as well. <laughs> so we have I, one or two. I think we can all rally about that. And we want to give you the opportunity to share your testimony of the Book of Mormon and Jesus Christ. And also, please, uh, before that, where can people find your work and may, maybe rename the book that you think if someone wants to get into yeah. this was the one they should yeah, buy? If you're me. interested in, in the Book of Mormon history from a Mesoamerican perspective, it, everything is collected in the one that's called Traditions of the Fathers, the Book of Mormon is History, cool. and okay. published by Coford Books. We'll you put can it find in the it on Amazon. Okay. Awesome. Look up my name on Amazon. You can find a whole bunch of stuff there. Awesome. Um, if you go to Interpreter Foundation, you can see articles that I've written. Those are free, so that's better. Mm-hmm. Cool. Uh, mm-hmm. And there is a book that I wrote and gave to them for free, so there's even a book there. A PDF, cool. Uh, because what I've done after the Mesoamerican stuff, I've started diving into the text itself and looking at um, Nephi and Mormon as writers mm-hmm. and you know how they wrote, why they wrote. Interesting. Uh, and so I've spent a lot of... That, that's probably the last 10 years of work rather than Mesoamerica. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I will say about the Book of Mormon is that no matter how deep I go into it, it's got more there. I, I haven't mined the depths. Um, and as an anthropologist, I, I remember when I was going through school, uh, one of my compatriots says, I don't know how you can be an anthropologist and still be religious. You know, because there's we just learn too many things about the way the world works, and I said, well, you, you know, your religion just has to be stronger than your anthropology, <laughs> and in this particular case, it's that darn Book of Mormon. I can see all kinds of things about Joseph Smith's church that were problematic. Um, you know, the, the early church. You yeah. know, the early church. I mean, it was a bumpy ride. 
It was a bumpy ride by the time you get into the Salt Lake. It's got its bumps now. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a time in the 70s when I went to my bishop and I said, you know, it seems like the church doesn't want people who are scholars to do these things. So there's been bumps. But there's that darn Book of Mormon. And Joseph said, you know, here is the keystone. This is the testament of Jesus Christ, and this thing stands. And whatever else happens in the church, that thing stands. And so, yeah, my testimony is firm on that one, absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. (laughs) Heck yeah. Thank you guys for watching, and until next time, stay curious and hungry.